Well, welcome to the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it's been a long time in Jeremiah, both in his book that bears his name as well as in Lamentations. Now we're going to move on uh, to Ezekiel and then Daniel. Now, Isaiah and Jeremiah, by way of introduction, were what we call pre-exilic prophets. So as we've gone through those books, uh, you recognize that both Ezekiel or Isaiah and Jeremiah were both warning Judah and Israel of impending disaster, impending invasion. So it was before the invasion, before the exile. When we come to Ezekiel and Daniel, we have two prophets that are writing, in fact, during the exile. We're going to fix uh, Ezekiel as writing after the um, exile in 597, but most of it is before the exile in 586, although the lat latter part of the book does seem to uh, discuss that. Um, there's a twofold message in the book of Ezekiel. One is that uh, a reminder that, look, you're in exile because you violated the Mosaic Covenant. And specifically, when we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant, we're speaking about the book of uh, Deuteronomy, the uh, second law. So they're in exile because they violated that covenant, and they're reaping the consequences of that. So that's only one message of the book. The other message of the book is that God is faithful. Even though they're not, uh, God is faithful. And their chastening, uh, that is God's punishment of them, is really a promise, not that he's abandoned them, but that, in fact, he will restore them, that he is correcting them and will restore them. It's interesting, as we look at the book as a whole, uh, chapters 1 through 24 are mostly uh, Jer uh, Ezekiel's mouth is closed. He doesn't speak. He's focused on the departure of God's glory, and his, his, his speech is really restricted to only when God allows him to speak. The middle part of the book, verses chapters 25 through 32, is a rehearsal of what we've seen before, judgment on the nations. And then in verses 33 through 48, he speaks of this coming return of glory to Jerusalem and to the temple. In fact, the uh, glory that he is anticipating is the glory that's going to come when Jesus returns from our New Testament perspective. From the Old Testament perspective, he's looking forward to the establishment of the kingdom. Now, Jeremiah, as we saw, was very topically arranged. Ezekiel, on the other hand, is very careful in chronology. In fact, there's 14 groups of prophecy through the book, and we'll point those out as we go, that are all firmly fixed in history because he gives us some very clear time markers throughout the book so we can follow chronologically what he's saying in the book. And a particular interest, as I mentioned, for end times prophecy is the restoration of Israel in chapters 36 through 37. And then there's a final wars that he talks about in chapters 38 and 39. And then following that, beginning in chapter 40 and going through the end of the book, is extensive prophecies of the millennial kingdom. Uh, that is the restoration of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, the establishment of uh, Israel's kingdom on the earth. And we know that to be the millennial kingdom that's spoken of in Revelation chapters 19 and 20. So let's get into the book now as we look at Ezekiel. First we see an introduction. So again, grab your book. I've got my Bible in front of me. So I've got the Bible right here. I've uh, divided my chapter up into bite-sized pieces here with a little note next to each section reminding me what it's about so you can help you think through the book. Uh, chapter verses uh, 1 through 3 are really the introduction. It's introducing Ezekiel. It says in verses 1 and 2 that he's basically 30 years old. Now, according to Numbers 4, uh, verse 3, this is the age that a uh, priest begins his priestly service. 
The introduction tells us that he's living among those in the Babylonian Empire. So he's probably writing about 593 B.C. Uh, I'm guessing that Ezekiel was deported in 597. So he went into that second of three exiles in 597. And again, uh, this is the first time marker that fixes us in history. In verse 3, just take a look at that really quickly. It says, The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. This is, this is confirming or affirming that Ezekiel has proven to be a true prophet of God. Makes it very clear here. So verses 1 through 3 are introducing the prophet and where he's at and what time he's prophesying. And then in verses 4 through 8, we get, we get this vision. And I've really labeled this chapter in my Bible over the top of it a weird vision. Hopefully that doesn't come across as too irreverent. But it is a weird vision. And it's always been kind of perplexing to people because of it's so unusual. It's really unique among the prophets, but it's not incomprehensible. Uh, we want to be careful not to overdo it. Oftentimes when we see um, visions like this, it seems to invite all sorts of uh, odd, unusual, even unbiblical speculation. This particular section of Ezekiel was used by an author by the name of Eric von Doniken in 1968 in a book called Chariots of the Gods. What he tried to do is he, explain, he tried to explain this vision as the arrival of a UFO and an alien visitation to Ezekiel. It's outlandish, it's weird, uh, but that's what happens sometimes when we come across um, these sorts of passages in the Bible, people use them to support all kinds of odd theologies. I want to be careful as we look at this. So what do we see here? Being very conservative, being very careful. We see in verses 4 to 14, we see four creatures. Now these are presented in a way that was going to be meaningful to God's people through Ezekiel the prophet. So this was meaningful to those people that Ezekiel originally spoke to. It may have lost some of its clearest meaning to us as we were reading this uh, thousands of years later. But as we learn more about the Bible and as we learn more about the culture, it becomes clearer and clearer to us. One thing that is clear from this uh, chapter is that God has not forgotten or abandoned his people in exile. Excuse me while I wet my whistle here. Yes, God's not forgotten them or abandoned them, but instead he reveals himself to Ezekiel in the land of Babylon in a very um, uh, dramatic, um, emphatic way that is emphasizing uh, not only his presence, but his presence with great power. This would have been very comforting to the people because, as I've said before, in the ancient Near East, it was often thought that if one nation conquered another, it meant that their God was more powerful. Well, Ezekiel is basically saying here that it's not that their God is more powerful. There is no one more powerful than our God, but you're being punished. You're being chastened. Verse 4 talks about a storm, and this is uh, typically in the Bible indicative of a judgment, perhaps anticipating the coming judgment in, fi in uh, 586. Again, preparing the people that this final cataclysmic um, um, pinnacle of judgment that's going to fall upon them in 586 is not because Babylon's gods are powerful but because the God of Israel is chastening his people. As you go through this section, I want you to carefully note phrases like John uses, or John, Ezekiel uses in verse 5, resembling. Or in verse 7, he says, what he's seeing is like a calf. 
or verse 13, it says something that looked like lights of like bolts of lightning in verse 14. All these things like resembling something that look like all these things are communicating to us that that Ezekiel is really straining the language to he's struggling to describe what he's seeing here. Uh, he's he's really um, trying to relate this in a way that people can understand. We see in Revelation chapters three and five that just like here. There's four living creatures around the throne of God. In Revelation, they seem to be different creatures. So Ezekiel seems to be seeing something different than what Jesus shows John in the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, there's similarities in the function, which in both cases seem to be to carry out God's judgment on, in Revelation on the earth. Here it's on God's people. Now, I'd caution you as you go through this section, we can't be too dogmatic about what John or Ezekiel is seeing here. Again, he's struggling against the limits of the language. But we can go through here and see what maybe the more responsible commentators have said. In verse 4, we see storm and fire, which is indicative of judgment, coming judgment on Judah. Verses 6 and 10, we see these four faces on these creatures. Shows different aspects of the creatures. It shows them to be intelligent, powerful, servants, quick to act. It shows the wings show them to be poised for a quick response. It's as if they're standing by uh, with um, ready to respond to the uh, slightest command that comes from the throne. Verse 7 seems to indicate that they are strong as pillars, they are stable, they are immovable. Again, an important message to a people who have been recently dislocated from their homes, exiled into a foreign nation. They're probably reeling and wondering what's going to become of them. And here they see in verse 7, these strong, stable, four creatures around God's throne ready to act. Verse 8 talks about their hands, which I think is indicative of skill. Verse 9, uh, not turning. So these uh, they're, they're on these uh, pedestals and they're not turning, but they're able to respond quickly to do God's will. And notice they all move in unison. There is no controversy. There is no discussion among them. Uh, God speaks and they do it all in unison. Verse 12 talks about the Spirit of God. Let's look, look at that. Each went straight forward wherever the Spirit was about to go. They would go without turning as they went. So they're directed, I think, here by the Spirit of God. They are very responsive. They a answer quickly. Um, verse 13, the burning, the torches of fire, the flashing. These are all indicative of judgment that's about to burst out. And again, uh, to the people in exile, this is a comfort to them that it's God that's judging them. Their God has not been overcome. He is stable. He is strong. He is skillful. He knows what's going on. He's powerful. He's got creatures that do his will at his slightest command. And he is bringing chastisement on his people. They're not abandoned. They're not lost. They're under God's chastisement. Verse 14 Look how they run. It says in verse 14, And the living creatures ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Imagine lightning in the sky. I saw some yesterday. just suddenly appears and it streaks across the sky and it's gone. And that's the picture here that they are constantly and quickly and spectacularly doing God's will. So again, if you are in exile and you are... Um, dislocated, you've lost everything, you're unstable, you don't know what you're going to do. This is an image of your God that shows him to still be in charge, an image that should give you at this point confidence and readiness to repent. Verses 15 through 21, I've labeled this section four wheels. 
And this is, again, a description, John struggling or Ezekiel struggling to say what this is, but seems to be a highly responsive war machine of some sort, or perhaps a siege machine. And a siege, a war machine would be like a catapult or a, a machine that fired lots of arrows that was used in battle. Siege machine would be something that would be rolled up to the walls of a city uh, to allow the soldiers to climb up and over the walls and storm the walls. Seems to be something like that here that's being described, some kind of siege machine. And again, Got to be careful here because when it's a um, lot of imagery, a lot of picturing, commentators just go crazy with their imagination. So we want to be very careful and try to limit ourselves uh, to what God is communicating here. And again, uh, taking a very conservative view, I think uh, something that is being clearly communicated is that God is powerful, He's intimidating. If you think the Babylonians have war machines, check out what God is. He's got these machines that are able to move anywhere quickly, immediately responsive to the direction of his spirit. So again, these uh, machines here go with these four creatures, emphasizing God's sovereignty, his rule, his power. And then Ezekiel looks even higher into heaven in verses 22 through 25. He sees what I've labeled here an expanse. And again, he seems to be straining, really struggling against the limits of language to describe the expanse he sees that is above the four living creatures, above the four wheels. He's looking deeper and deeper into heaven and he's seeing this expanse there and he's just just um, trying to um, explain this. The voice he hears over, the, over their heads or ruling over them is the voice of God, I think. And look at their reverent response in verses 24 and 25. God speaks, and I heard, well, look at verse 24. Uh, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant water, so they went like the voice of the Almighty. Sound of tumult that was the sound of an army camp. Wherever they stood still, they dropped their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. So they're being very reverent, they're being obedient. Uh, this uh, war, this power is ready to be unleashed. And these creatures are ready to unleash it. They're just waiting obediently for the command. Verses 26 through 28, we see a man at the end of the chapter here. Again, uh, Ezekiel's vision is looking ever higher into heaven. He sees the, what's over the earth and then above the earth and then into the heavens. He's seeing uh, a vision of a throne, and on this throne, a being seemingly a man. I think this is likely a Christophany, that is a uh, Old Testament um, picture of the pre-incarnate Christ in his royal glory. I think this is what we're looking at. The idea here is that uh, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, is standing by. He's waiting, he's on the throne, he's ruling, and everything is in place for him to bring his uh, ultimate kingdom to the earth, a kingdom that Daniel's going to talk to us about. And it's all standing by. Again, what a great opening to this book for those who are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, wondering, has God abandoned us? Has he become weak? Uh, has he... We've been taken out of his hand by these foreign gods, and the answer is a resounding no. So how do we apply this to ourselves in the church? Well, let me suggest a couple of things. First of all, um, above and beyond even the most powerful kingdoms of the earth, and list them as they are being revealed now. We have China that seems to be uh, always threatening. 
We have Russia that seems to be always threatening and forming alliances against Israel. We have the nations around Israel that are always jockeying to, for position over that country. Above and beyond all these kingdoms of the earth, even above and beyond the United States, there's a kingdom that's still coming. Daniel's going to tell us a lot about that kingdom, but Ezekiel tells us that that kingdom is waiting, it's irresistible, and it's powerful, and that's where we are to put our hope, in this coming kingdom that's waiting to be unleashed on the earth. Also, God's Old Testament people were not forgotten, and the kingdom they longed for, the kingdom that God promised them way back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, that's not going to be frustrated. Even in exile, God's with him. Same for us. We are scattered as aliens over the earth, as Peter says. And the same power that's used to consummate the chastening of God's people and bring in that kingdom is going to be exercised within the church to purge and cleanse and purify the church, to rapture the church to heaven, and to bring in that promised kingdom. That same power is going to be at work. And as in the Old Testament, so in the New Testament, brothers and sisters, may we all live in light of his coming. May we all live today, in the coming day, in light of the kingdom that the Messiah is going to bring soon, in my view. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. God bless you as we get into the book of Ezekiel.